Hello. Welcome to the first of our MFA faculty readings in Shop Talk in this series. We're so pleased that you could join us. In these extraordinary times, we need each other as writers and thinkers. We need to keep writing and thinking. We need to keep struggling to keep our voices heard. This, af this afternoon, you're going to be hearing readings from Genevieve Crane, Amy Hempel, Cornelius Eady, and me. I want to thank Robert Reeves and Carla Cagliotti for the valiant efforts they've made to hold us all together uh, in the various programs that we have. And I also want to thank the Wiz Frank Imperial for being able to orchestrate the technology. Our faculty has been extraordinary in figuring out technology that we've never had to figure out before. And um, so we're going to get better at it. And we all we want to do is make sure we stay together as a writing group. Genevieve Crane will read first. I'm all set. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's Genevieve Sly Crane. I am uh, writing and reading from my office today. So excuse my embarrassing bookshelf. Um, because I teach a class on infidelity this semester, I thought I would read something related to infidelity. Um, so this is a story that I've been working on called Hungry Ghost. Okay, so Hungry Ghost. Two co-workers fall in love, but have not confessed it to each other yet. Rick is married, he is living with someone. It's a shame, but still, they fall in love. That's what they call it anyway, because there is a tether between them, sometimes taught, sometimes slackened, that they seemingly have no autonomy over. Cricket does not remember their first meeting, but he does. It was six years ago, an employee training, another world. He says her hair was in a braid, and she quoted a poem by Rilke, something about the flapping of terrible wings. It's horrific. Who was that woman? Braids? Rilke? What kind of pretension had she been carrying, and how many people saw? But somehow, he does not see her this way in his reality. Now, sitting across from her at his desk, he recounts the first time he touched his arm and how he felt, in his words, a solar flare. She wonders how many men that she has done this to. Both options, others or none, are frightening. There is a glass panel beside his office door, cutting a view into the hallway and his oddly slackened little faces, tailored pants are hurrying past. Craig sits prim, hands in her lap, hyper aware of her posture, her breathing. They cannot touch one another in case a face peeks in. He is sitting wide-legged in his chair. He looks bewitched. Cricket says to him, the solar flare, really? Honestly, he says, it was like I'd been struck. Stricken, she says, now's not the time for syntax, he tells her. For months, they have been hovering around this conversation. You feel this way still, she asks him. I do, he says. Later, on the train home, she thinks of this exchange of recoils. Her husband is a generous man named Neil, with a face like a bull terrier. His teeth are massive, eyes are small. He wears horn-rimmed glasses as if he were impersonating a professorial father on a sitcom. He is six years older than she, which once felt more important to their marriage. When she gets home, he greets her in the hallway and holds her face in his hands like it is a fragile thing before he kisses her. Where did she learn to do that, she asks him. The movies, he says. It would have been better if he had lied and said it was of his own devising. Several months before, they went to a therapist and Cricket told Neil that he needed to be more spontaneous with her. The therapist, but the banality of the request was humiliating. Still, he asked how. I can't tell you how, she said. It sounds like Neil is asking for your help, the therapist said. I want more romance, Cricket said. Can you define romance, the therapist asked. And Cricket couldn't do it. I tell you I love you every day, Neil said. He was near tears with his frustration. But I want to know why you love me, she said. Why do you need to know why, the therapist asked. Pickett looked at her and fantasized very briefly about what it would be like to pinch her rosy upper arm. Maybe a schedule is in order, the therapist suggested. A commitment to spontaneity. Later, Cricket found how to be spontaneous with spouse in an open tab on Neil's desktop. All of the search results were geared toward wives, desperately seeking to reseduce their husbands. In bed, Cricket lies beside Neil while he sleeps. Sweet Neil accounts the things that she adores about him. He 
his rapid commitment to the piping plover, a species of local bird, which, according to one of his many notes on the subject, has been declining in population since the 1940s, obliquely due to the Second World War. His ability to remember the nuances of mundane life, cardboard recycling on Thursdays, for example, his appreciation for VLOOKUP in itself, the fact that he can recall the color of paint in their living room, its number, its matte finish. He wonders what her lover, is he a lover if they aren't sleeping together yet? Looks like when he sleeps. Then, walking on the eyes of her own psyche, she turns some shady corners and finds herself in ugly territory. These are the things that she fears in herself. Um, the desire she has when she finds a smooth stone at the beach, put it in her mouth and swallow. Who? Her instinct to constantly check her shadow as she walks. She wonders obsessively about its distortion and size. She wonders if, on a molecular level, it has any weight at all. Three, the strange surge of vertigo that she gets in the shower, often, forcing her to lean hard against the tile until she can stabilize. It's because she runs the water too hot for too long that anything less doesn't permeate, feels insubstantial. On the train the next morning, she notices that the commuter who usually sits beside her is gone. Instead, a girl with a green striped pair of knee socks boards. The rest of the train is suited and dozing, but this girl is on FaceTime, talking to a friend. Couldn't find the ones with DHA, she says. They have Foley, but not DHA. Is that bad? Her friend's response is tinny and distorted. You're cutting out, the girl says, annoyed, as if her friend had chosen to have poor reception. It goes on like this for the rest of the trip. A discussion of DHA and 4G. Thanks. If you were worrying about DHA, then you should to be young enough to think that knee socks are a good idea. Cricket thinks, I don't want this life. Cricket thinks, this is my life. This is everywhere. Because ultimately, goodness is obeying the ugly demands of mediocre and how hard it is to execute each day, to get up on the first alarm, to shower without scalding, to eat a sense of yogurt and oat mix berry breakfast, pop back on touch, walk instead of drive to the train, to avoid the beckoning of social media, to cock the shower, and schedule a pap smear, and never, not once, tell your seatmate on the train that their life is utterly futile and that they are full of obviously poor decisions that will drown them. She takes note of the hotel, wonders which floor she will inevitably be on, which window she will stare out of while her lover sleeps satiated. But at work, he isn't in. It's concerning, but there's no way for her to contact him. They are careful people, and they don't convey anything in writing. Four months ago, when the tone of their relationship started to change, no flirtations over text. By 11, she emails his work account about a meeting that afternoon. She'd love for him to join in if he's available. He replies at 11.17. Paula has the flu and he's home taking care of her, he says. He's working remotely and is happy to call in for the meeting. She drags his email to the trash, then recovers it and deletes it several more times until it feels good. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve, so much. Um, so now Amy Hintel will read. Thank you again, Genevieve. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, I'm going to read part of a story from my first book, Reasons to Live, which uh, one of my brothers suggested I retitle Reasons to Live Indoors. Uh, this is the beginning of cool night, but a disaster I lived through many years ago. This time it happened with fire, just the way it happened before, the time it happened with water. Someone was losing everything to water, to fire, and not trying not to. Maybe I wasn't losing everything, but I didn't try to save it. That is what makes it like the first time. The first time no one said anything or we talked about everything but. It was 28 years since the river topped its banks, all that time since a flood skunked the reservoir and washed out people's homes. We watched the water come when it did. From patios late at night, the neighborhood watched the water move. A flash of light like strobe light would go off on the ground as the watery debris snapped a high tension wire. When the wires touched the water, that part of town went black. This was the thing we watched, the city going dark along the path of the flood. It was not supposed to reach us, and then it did. 
Evacuation was calm and quick, but during the days of cleanup, it was not what anyone mentioned. We talked about the racehorses loose from Centennial Track, how they had cantered over lawns and stumbled on buried sprinkler heads. Indoors were rolls of wet toilet paper swelling on bathroom rods. We found letters and water had washed off the ink. We talked about Bunny Winton, who ordered a new living room the first morning after. She said she was happy to see her armchairs go. The padded arms cat scratched down to cotton batting. You open up or you shut down, Bunny said, and went out and got her hair styled new. Film crews photographed the swim team at the club. They were lined up by the snack bar, waiting to get a tetanus shot so they could shovel mud. Bunny made the nightly news. The Vitafont spelled out victim on her chest. They showed her in a tree wrapping washcloths around a branch so that the wet bent wood would not squeak against the roof. Pool night. We were looking at our we were looking at pictures of ourselves and family. The looking was my mother's idea, my mother who was the thoughtful one. Here's what my mother thought of when she heard that Bunny Winton had lost her photograph album. She put me to work on ours. Gray came over to help me at her invitation, of course. <clears throat> Gray was Bunny's son, the child she could not now watch grow up in snapshots page after page until my mother remembered that he grew up in ours. We would pull every picture that included Gray Winton, print up another and present a new album to his grateful parents. Gray was a junior lifeguard at the pool. He tanned to the color of the cornflakes he ate each morning, and I knew girls who saved his chewed gum. Gray was the only boy excused from working cleanup. That was the week he was under observation. He and my brother were aquazaniacs. They trained with a coach to do slapstick acrobatics off the high dive at the pool. There were six aquazaniacs in 1890 stripes who hurled themselves into the water in syncopated ways. Gray would stand on my brother's shoulders and together they dove as the 12 foot man. <clears throat> in the pratfall sport of clown diving, the walk around gainer is a popular stunt. This is where you run to the end of the board and then keep on running out in the air, a cartoon, so fast you flip over backward. Put gravity at your service is how they said they did it. But during rehearsal, Gray candied out. He hit his head on the board coming down. It would have kept him from diving on pool night, but the rain date gave him time to try to perfect the fire dive. In the album, there were pictures of Gray and water. The first one was in our bathtub playing Stormy Ocean with my brother as a baby. Later, they pull a raft across a lake, poking an oar at snapping turtles. The picture that follow show the boys uh, coming from behind. Uh, sorry, I'm skipping a paragraph. Some of the photographs were Polaroid ones. They were faded, but the fugitive images remained. Emulsion on others had turned metallic bronze. The snapshots held deep tarnish like a mirror. There were quite a few pictures of Bunny too. With the unphotogenic's eagerness to pose, she increased her chances of the one good shot that would let her relax, having proof at last that she had once looked good, just once. I thought the, uh, the doctor couldn't make it to the picnics or to the skating, so he didn't show up in the pictures either. The effect was of him saying after the flood, what I lose will always be lost. His problem is the past, Grace said about his father. He says, only do things you've done before and liked, whereas me, what's coming is the thing I'm looking out for. I thought the present was the safer bet. We can only die in the future, I thought. Right now, we're always alive. Gray trusted water. He continued to trust it after the flood. He believed it would save him and he counted on this for the fire dive. I saw him do it once, which is all the times he did it. When the swimming pool was filtered and rechlorinated, he carried a can of gasoline to the high board. 
He wore a sweatshirt with a hood and matching drawstring pants. He dove into the water with the top and bottoms on, then pulled himself out by the ladder on the side. It was night and I had my camera ready. He sprinkled his wet clothes with gasoline as though he were watering plants. He said wet cloth would pull the fuel away from his skin. He said to imagine this, that the moment he hit the water aflame when he made this dive on pool night, that's when he would have a cannon go off. Then he struck a lighter and he lit himself up good. Thank you. Amy, extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now Cornelius Eady is going to be reading. Thank you. Cornelius? Okay. Here we go. Um, I'm actually going to just read a few poems from a cycle I've been working on uh, about Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley is the, uh, I think most people, a lot of people know, as the first, uh, uh, we say African-American poet uh, to be published, a uh, woman poet to be published in, in, in America in the colonies. She was um, kidnapped uh, from, from um, West Africa when she was about seven or eight years old. We don't know for sure how old she actually was. And she was found and she was uh, taken over to Boston where she was bought by a, uh, a, a rich family, uh, a, a well-to-do family called the Wheatleys, who were also abolitionists. And they soon discovered that she had a, a, a talent for writing poetry. And that led to um, broadsides and then uh, the publication in England of her first book. So for, for me, the, the, the fascination with Wheatley is, uh, of course, that she's, she's not only the, the first, uh, uh, what we could call consider African-American to, to publish a full length book of poetry, but, but also um, that uh, one, of her, one of her poems, I think, um, really sort of illustrates the idea of, of what has been the African-American aesthetic in response to the African-American aesthetic and the way we respond to it. Uh, but I was really trying to figure out a way to make, to, to, to talk about the, uh, get the poems I think in some ways sort of figure out the, the uh, what it must have felt like for her to, to, to lose one language to gain another, um, and then learn how to turn that into poetry. So let me read, this is the start. I'm not gonna read, only read a few poems, the, the, uh, the, but you need to know this one poem bi-weekly. And, and this is called Being Brought From Africa to America, and I will, some, I will also, you'll hear a little references to it uh, in the other poems of mine. So, On Being Brought From Africa to America from, by Phyllis Wheatley. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Whence I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. And I was in a reading um, with, uh, in, in Washington State years ago, and I was talking to an African, uh, African American scholar, and she, she brought up two things that one that Wheatley, even though she doesn't really talk about, um, outright about, about her experience of being captured, she does sprinkle it through her book. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, brought up an interesting dilemma, which I had never thought of until that moment, which is that Wheatley's book was published in, in England. She went over to England with one of the Wheatley family to have the book published. The moment that she stepped off the, off the, off the boat and onto English soil, she was, she was technically free. She didn't have to go back. Uh, but, but, and, she, and she was wined and dined. Uh, she was a celebrity of, over in London. Um, and, uh, but when the word came back that one of the Wheatley family was, was sick, she got back on the boat and went back uh, to Boston. So why did she do that? <laughs> so so uh, these, those two things are, are, in, are in this poem, um, Mercy. Um, this is to Phyllis Wheatley's mother. And again, another snatch of Wheatley's uh, own poetry uh, that actually talks about this, uh, her time in uh, as being a slave, one of the few references she does. I, young in life, by seemingly cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor 
in my parents' breasts, Phyllis Wheatley. To Phyllis Wheatley's mother, they say your daughter is a rare orchid. She lives in a fancy house on a high street. They named her after the ship which bore her wild, they claim, across the waves. They say your daughter is a cuckoo's egg. She walks the street in English garb. She did not fill the shark's belly. She does not sweep, hole, or breed. She stood just once upon the block. Your daughter is exotic as white pepper. She reads, she travels, and when she dreams, a clean head kisses a starched pillow. She can cradle the owner's spell book between her dark hands. She has learned to sing in a robber's tongue. Your daughter's quill make patriots blink. Her black skin, spooled parchment, poem, bill of sale. God has given her a kingdom you can hardly pronounce. Sometimes in her famous book, a line will slip and she is returned unrefined before Mrs. Wheatley scooped the sickly child fed her broth and bound books. Alas, my dusky mother, she writes, if only she knew the first note of mercy is pain. Wheatley in London. Her second voyage is kind. She steps down the gang plank onto English soil, an American slave with her masters in tow, and a manuscript so outrageous no one in the colonies dare kiss it with ink. Her second voyage is paid for. The only thing that will be bound here are her free thoughts stitched into a spine. Here, the proof of her is no debate. The arrow of the Lord wears a lady's gown and thrums the air with her rhymed liberation. The rich folk come from miles to touch the chattled hand that scratched out a book to feel holy astonishment wash their ears. Dusky muse, wonder wheel, she speaks and her mind is fire. She speaks and mercy is a small dark sparrow. Lexicon. The good Lord puts new sounds in the heathen's mouth. Holy is a word that burns the fingers as you cradle the book. A stern beard that plucks a child from her mother, a law that names you chattel then blesses your soul. Turn the page and read a story about the skin you wear and what that mark earns you. Say faith, a veil of questions you get to pull back perhaps with your last breath. Roll it on your tongue, sickly girl, and then there's mercy. When you stood, shivering on the Boston block, draped only in a dirty carpet, you had no words for what came towards you out of the wronged air. How your mind would lick that word like butter once you found it. Translation. There's an epigraph by June Jordan. Come to this country a slave, and how should you sing, June Jordan? How do you say this in Senegalese? My mother is gone. I dream my father calls my name, but I cannot feel his arms. The ship is a crazy beast. These irons cut my legs, and the air reeks of shit and piss. I am sick and thinning from hunger. What happens to me in this strange place? What is the tongue of this hostile tribe? New birds, cold air, narrow streets, hard and uneven to walk, slop and thirst on the tongue. If you scream your name and no one listens, if you yell where you come from and people stare through you, are you a girl or a ghost? What did Phyllis tell the Wheatleys that first day with them? Clothes, they sing. Broth, they say, soap and water to soothe whatever she babbles. I was reading two more. Um, benighted. In order to learn this word, the slave girl has to shake off her pagan tongue. She is ape to her owner's hearing. They are an alp alphabet a cup of noise poured into her dark ear. Apples don't know they have a name, have a taste, crisp or tart, a way to describe how it feels when white teeth break the skin. 
The beagle never knows what their owner calls his breed, only his master's whistle. The Bible will tell her. There was a young, dark girl. Before she found mercy, hoof, drum, and mud was her maiden name. The hatchling doesn't know what to call its egg tooth, why the first word of her new world is called Phyllis. And finally, there was, there was, a, there was a trial to, to prove that Phyllis Wheatley actually wrote the book that she wrote because she was a slave. And uh, we're talking about the idea of does the does slaves actually have the capacity to actually write complex language. So um, she actually, there actually was a trial. Um, uh, uh, the prominent people had to sit there and, and Phyllis had to prove that she actually did write the book. And they did, they, they, they did um, let her have it. But the trial of Phyllis Wheatley, excuse me. She claimed she wrote a book, but here's what could have happened. In order to make a point, to move things along, a rich white man in pre-revolutionary Boston decides to raise some abolitionist sand by pretending to be a young black female slave, burning with the good word, bristling with Alexander Pope. Maybe he owns a printing press. Maybe he's got some buddies to go along with the gag. Up and down the block fly the broadsides, between slugs of ale and church hymns, the panic of black verse. An alternative could be all of the above, plus a young black female slave with bearded to the cause. Teach her to recite just enough, petticoat her just enough, an indentured rebel. Written by Phyllis Wheatley, a slave owned by John Wheatley, versed by Phyllis Wheatley, a teen ethos late of Africa. If a Negro can write a poem, why not a fish then? Why not a cloud with feet? What is your name? A long way from home, sir. What is your tongue? Poetry and the breath of the Lord. What is your accent? A patriot, sir. It will take a jury of proper white men to prove this true. John Hancock, who swear in ink, this we saw. The paper, the quill, her black hand singing. Thanks. <laughs> Such powerful poetry, Cornelius. Um, and so now I'm going to read, uh, and this is from a oh. memoir I'm working on right now called, um, uh, it's called Tinkling, and it's about who really hears and who is deaf, uh, and there's a bully involved. I could hear the tinkling of the bottles in the trunk of the Cadillac. Today he'd had an episode. He was coming from the surgery. That's what he called the embalming room in the basement when he stopped walking. He stood in the garage, his eyes glazing over, his entire body rigid. Uncle Bill, I said, Uncle Bill. Then I knew I had to find Aunt Margaret. He's having one of his attacks. She dropped the basket of sheets she'd been washing for the ambulance service and ran to the garage, grabbed a bottle of glucose from the refrigerator, popped the top with a church key, and held it to his lips. He shook his head back and forth, the liquid trickling out of the side of his mouth, eyes squeezed shut as he fought her. Slowly he came back to life, blinking, his body softening. He pushed her hands away. That's enough, he said. She stood watching him for a few minutes, then went to the funeral home kitchen to get a sandwich. He concentrated on his chewing as his breathing became more regular. Okay, let's go deliver that book to the Sanders house, he told me. That evening, Aunt Margaret pulled the rum and syrup from the refrigerator where she kept it right next to her mink wrap in the glass jar. I'm so dry, Uncle Bill said, and popped yet another blatz with the church key kept in the drawer next to his den chair. During the evening, Aunt Margaret sat at a kitchen bench in, in the house, brushing my hair. Oh, I'd always wanted a baby. We just could never have one. We tried and tried. She went off to take her bath, and I wandered back to the den where Uncle Bill had several brown bottles lined up in perfect order on the floor next to him. You want a sip? He winked at me. I shook my head no. He finished another bottle. Well, I guess it's time to take our ride. He put the bottles into the crate. He was still wearing his suit and starched white shirt, although he'd taken off his tie. He and I walked outside where the Indiana humidity hurt my sunburned arms. You're my sugar, he said, putting the crate into the car's trunk. 
Every other night, we'd drive through the dark to a different place, way, way out in the countryside, the bottles tinkling. I listened to the bottles crashing apart as he threw them into a trash heap. Well, that's that, Sugar, he said, getting behind the wheel of the car. He put a ginger mint into his mouth. Want one? Thank you for joining us. Now, if anybody has questions, Frank uh, can post them on the screen. Uh, what's this reader's name? Melissa Berger. Uh, this is Luann Walker. Is, are you talking about the reddish haired one? So we want to thank you for joining us in this, our first foray into uh, this new world. Um, and we just, please keep writing. That's all we ask of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.